Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are eager to get started today and very excited uh, about our topic, the role of talent development in change management. And our guest expert today, Dana Thos. Actually, Dana, I may be butchering your name. You and I have known each other now for a couple of years. Uh, pronounce your last name for me. Thank you for asking. It's Dana Theus like Prius. Well, I knew I wasn't saying it right. Oh, that is better. Dana Theus, thank you so much. Well, so for those of you that are joining us, I want to say thank you. And this webinar is meant for you. So do let us know if you have questions or what you would like to get out of your time with us today. We want to make it useful and relevant and meaningful. If you're joining us over your lunch break, it should be as good as your lunch or better. So do help us know how to make that possible. So um, also feel free to say hello to your peers. You'll see a chat box. If you hover down over the uh, dashboard strip, what you'll see is a little chat feature there, or you can hit Alt H at any time, and it should bring up a chat box. Say hello. Let us know where you're calling from, what part of the world, and of course, what we can do today to make this a, a really meaningful webinar for you. So let's just get started. So Dana, if you will proceed to the next slide, I want to say hello and thank you to our sponsor, the Whitmarsh Consulting Group sponsors all of our webinars and they are a group of seriously talented and skilled experts who specialize in creating revenue streams through digital marketing. So if your organization would benefit from expanding your digital footprint or strategy, do check them out at wcg-bp.com. And my name is Anissa Avon, and I am the CEO of Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions. I founded Turnkey in 2004, so over 15, or about 15 years ago now. And we are a full service employee development and learning solutions provider and consultancy firm. We have expert coaches and trainers and OD consultants in every major metropolitan area in the U.S. and in key hubs globally. Our services include everything from employee assessments to level and budget appropriate coaching programs to more, more than 400 leadership and employee development training programs. So if your organization would benefit from some consulting around employee or management development needs at the end of our our webinar today, Dana and I will be uh, opening our consultancy hotline uh, for a free consultation. Uh, we're told that these sessions, uh, we call them fast pass strategy sessions because A, there's no obligation and B, our aim is to support you in defining the needs and the best practice approach so that at the end of a 60 minute conversation, you have something that you can take back and strategize and implement whether you choose to work with us or not. Um, we know that over time, if we are the right resource, that you'll reach back out. So I hope you'll take us up on that offer. So I am very excited to introduce our guest expert today, Dana Theus. Dana is an executive coach and trainer who spent more than 20 years fine-tuning her employee and leadership development expertise, as well as her expertise on change management. She actively worked in the front lines of business, working with Fortune 50 companies, tech startups, and even nonprofits. However, Around 19, no, sorry, 2009, Dana um, has started working with leaders and companies as an executive coach and organizational development consultant. She is an author and a radio host on Executive Leaders Radio, a number one business talk radio show, and her thought leadership articles have been featured in uh, prestigious uh, magazines and online areas such as National Journal Next America, Smart Brief on Leadership, and TrainingIndustry.com. So what did I miss, Dana? What exactly makes you the expert on the role of talent development in change management? <laughs> Great question. Um Actually, what makes me the, you gave all the, 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 the facts, but I believe that what makes me the expert is I've actually been studying this personally through my entire life. When I go back and look at like what interests me from the very earliest days, you know, I was like noticing how people were reacting to change because I love change and I've never really understood 
you know, why people didn't. So I kind of made it an area of study. And so as I came into executive coaching, it was an obvious place for me to take what I learned and what I'd studied and start transferring it to my clients, both as individuals and in organizational contexts um, in consulting and in training, you know, to try to equip executives and leaders inside organizations to lean into change and become masters of change instead of letting it blow them about. Love it. That's very helpful. And I think that this topic is very timely. And I also agree that most of, uh, most of us, uh, both on an organizational level, corporate level, et cetera, as well as individuals, we don't quite understand why change is so hard or that we even need to have an awareness around change and behavior change and, and how to set ourselves up for success. So I'm very pleased that you're going to be walking us through some of the things that you've learned and, and providing some best practice approaches for organizations. Um, well, that's a great place to jump into what I hope to cover today. Um, this is such a big topic area. You know, I like to boil it down to the pieces that I find that when I do work with leaders individually and organizationally that, that make the biggest differences for them. Like where do they find the ahas that are, that are able to implement very quickly and with a large impact. So that's essentially what I'm going to be covering today are the highlights. There's a lot more to talk about, but I'm going to be making the effort to give everyone on the call here some high level understanding of some of the challenges, but also some kind of concepts that are very implementable as well. Um, and I echo what Anissa said that I'd be more than happy to get on calls and, you know, brainstorm with people as to, you know, how, does, how do these concepts potentially roll out into your world? Uh, but I'll be doing it also with a specific focus on the perspective that HR brings to the table, because in a lot of my work, not all of it, but in a lot of it, I do work with HR um, as, as they're being asked to play a role in change. And um, I've observed, you know, some really constructive ways that, that people in talent management and development and, and HR more broadly can play a role. So we'll be putting that lens on it, uh, particularly at the end. Um, you know, I mentioned in the opening there that, you know, often we, we feel blown about by change. Sometimes this image, you know, this is, this is what we want. We want to set the direction. We want to say, go there and then have this powerhouse behind us, which is our organization, just ride us there. And this is kind of the executive view. You know, I want to set the direction and have my organization behind me a hundred percent, you know, going wherever I want us to go. Um, and sometimes this feels good and sometimes this feels scary <laughs> because you know you can't see your organization very well um but regardless of whether you like that image or not this is usually what ends up happening <laughs> <laughs> you tell the horse to go and the horse kind of looks at you like what and the thing to me that is most meaningful about this this stat over here that this was a 2016 stat CEB, by the way, has now become Gartner. Gartner absorbed it, so maybe I should update this slide. Um, but anyway, the study that they did in 2016 was about HR and leadership, and, and I'll show you some other information from that study that was interesting later. But um, I remember when Gartner first did a study on how effective is change in organizations in the early 90s. And back then, we were really just talking about changing out software systems. Like, that was the big change paradigm. Uh, what is coming up on 30 years ago, I'm sorry to say. But back then, the stat was like 30% of change initiatives were successful. And I looked at the stat in 2016, and I said, what? Are you kidding me? We're only 4% more successful than we were you know, 30 years ago? That is terrible. Um, and yet, we are. And, and I have come to believe in my work that this is part of the reason, which is there's a lot of work out there about change management, which I would be pointing at that bottom line. Like, how do you manage your way from A to B? We need a new software system. We need a new organizational design, or we have a new organizational design. We need to roll it out. Um, we need to, to um, reorganize how, uh, you know, our, how anything works. You know, we get a new 
acquisition. Oh boy, we've got to absorb them. You know, what does that look like? And, and we want to manage our way through it. We want a to-do list. We want a checklist. We want a project plan. And there's been 30 years of development on how to do that and change. And now the big change leaders, excuse me, the change management gurus are saying, oh, wow, project management, change management are pretty much the same, <laughs> which is ironic to me. And what's going on is the top line is really what tends to happen. It just never goes the way we can plan it. No, no plan, you know, plans are irrelevant five minutes after they're launched. And a lot of the change management literature and rubric doesn't really have a good way to deal with that. So I take that top line and I say to leaders, this is your job. The project managers can manage the tasks. Your job is to manage the chaos and to understand when things go off track why and get it back on track because your job is to get it to be so i make this distinction between management and leadership and with my executive coaching clients we focus on the top line with organizational training we focus more on the bottom line and give them an appreciation for you know that the top line will exist anyway and and how to uh, build a project plan build a plan that it that allows for that um, and this is something else that we're finding and part of the reason that this topic is continuing to be so relevant besides the fact that we're not being terribly more successful is that 30 years ago most of the change coming on board was new big back-end software systems you know erp was just being developed data processing was still in many ways on a large scale in its infancy and so a lot of change management theory was built around software uh, transitions. But today we're seeing change coming in much different areas. I mean, technology is still there, um, but we're also seeing the need to adapt to new culture. Market changes are happening very fast. Lots of restructuring, both for mergers, acquisitions, and other, um, and lots more turnover uh, in the organization, but particularly in leadership, all of which introduces a lot of different kinds of change. So the sense of overwhelm is pretty typical. So I think now is a good time to just do a quick check with the group and see, you know, what kinds of change are you dealing with? If you can put the poll up, we'll see you know, who's online. Uh, in there we go. Our uh, and it's a multiple choice. So my organization is undergoing change in the following areas, um, culture change, restructuring, market expansion, leadership transition, merger or acquisition. Uh, I'm laughing because I wouldn't be surprised if many folks on the call go, yep, 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 and yes. <laughs> Yes, the last time I did a version of this, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Well, it, it's, it's funny, not funny. Um, it is extraordinarily difficult to um, enable leaders through any kind of a development program to be impactful without considering uh, behavior change best practices or uh, even adult learning best practices coupled with change management and vice versa. It's very difficult to navigate culture change without empowering leaders with the knowledge and the competencies and the skill sets they need to be effective leaders, to know when to coach, to know when to direct, to know when to correct, to know when <laughs> you, you get the idea, when to hold them, when to fold them, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to launch our poll. Here are the results. I'm going to share the results on the screen. And we have 67% said, yes, we're going through culture change. 67% are going through restructuring. Uh, 67, here's our magic number through market expansion. 78% are going through leadership transition. And uh, more than half, that's a really big number for merger acquisition. I'm not surprised. We are in the age of acquisition and mergers, uh, uh, but one out of two, more than that on our call. That's kind of scary. That is interesting. And it's also interesting that um, culture change and leadership transition are really related. So if you're in leadership transition, you are in culture change. <laughs> Fair statement. Um, well, okay, so you're in good company. And this is a breakdown of that stat I showed you before that 34% of change efforts are clear successes. 16% uh, were found to have mixed results. So the clear failure is only 50%. So that means you have a 50% chance of 
surviving your change effort <laughs> is what I take this, what, how I read this. And I do think it's also interesting that on this questionnaire and, and on this stat that we just looked at, whoops, sorry, um, they didn't even put technology change on there. Mm. And I think that's because it is now standard. Yeah. It, like yes. That is now not changed. That's just the way things are, that we're going to have new technologies coming in. And yet, since we still have not mastered change, <laughs> technology change continues to be part of our challenge. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and we have work to do to figure it out. So what I'd like to do is dive in a little bit to this distinction that I make between change management and change leadership. And, and we're really going to focus on the leadership piece. Um, but I wanted to make a point about change management. I said before that it's very much about, you know, the, the, the tasks and things to do and the project plan. And there are models out there that give us ways to build a project plan for change that does adapt to a lot of the change specific things. But I look at a lot of these models uh, in the change management rubric as um, basically risk mitigation. In other words, we have to have a vision of how we get from A to B. And we have to think through the risks that are gonna be there. Um, and we have to plan for them. And, and so we need a management model that's gonna help us mitigate risk and see as much as we can coming around the corner. But we also have to be thinking in terms of what we can't see. And that's where leadership comes in. And, and the primary things that are happening in change leadership um, it conceptually is that while we're managing the project stage by stage, the leaders are, they're seeing the big picture because when, the, when, the, when things go wrong in the weeds, somebody's gotta be up at the top looking out over, okay, wait, we're going a little too far west. We're still trying to reach that mountain that's due south. So, you know, hey, let's call a pause and uh, get back on track. And the leaders are looking for the things that can't be put on paper. And that's where we get into things like resistance and some of the things I'm gonna talk about, which are there's some things you just can't build a model for because you don't know what it is until it appears. And so the leaders are looking for it to appear and then deal with what's there, not what is the perfect vision of what should or shouldn't be there. Uh, Cause what's there is what's there. So um, I'm curious if we can do another poll quickly here about who makes in your organizations, do you make a distinction between change management and change leadership in terms of your talent development and your talent management strategies in particular? Excellent. Oh, there's the poll, one moment. All right, now we're launching. My organization makes a distinction between change management and change leadership. This is such an interesting question, Dana, because I think um, oftentimes I, it, it's a little bit of a leading question, isn't it? Um, there, there isn't a distinction. Um, and, and I find in the work that we do with companies, most often there's a, a lack of, well, what do you mean? How is that different exactly? And I think... Go ahead. Well, and I came to this personally because one of my past lives, I was a project manager. And so I know project management meant, and when I started learning change management, I said, this just looks like project management with some extra task things in it. And then I began to work with more larger, more specific change uh, initiatives and with leaders. And I began to see, okay, no, there are things going on here that are not in the project plan. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy to say that some people are saying yes. I, I am too. One out of three. So uh, almost half though are uh, re mirror my experience. Well, what do you mean? What's the difference here between change management and change leadership? Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and I'm going to answer that from my point of view. Um, and there are other definitions and other approaches to this. Absolutely. Um, I'm putting up here my change management model here, uh, which I did based on research of a lot, like about six different top line change management models. I consolidated them for a client um, and I have since used this successfully in some other client engagements. And, and my point in putting this up here is <laughs> we don't have time to walk through all these different things, 
But my point is, is that there are three phases to a management model. There's a planning, implementation, and the handoff. Oftentimes we say change doesn't stick because we never bother to hand it off. We never adjust it to reality once it's launched. So those three phases are very important. And in each phase, there's some very specific things that need to be thought about. Now, not all of these things take time. Not all of these things are gonna be relevant fully for every project. But if you use this as a checklist, you'll be thinking through a lot of the things that typically go wrong. Now, I'm not gonna spend time on this today because it's A, there's too much, and B, I wanna give you these leadership lessons. These bottom three bars, alignment, transforming resistance, and focus, those are the three leadership lessons that I focus on with leaders, and I wanna tell you why. Um, in brief, the three things that, that I observe, and not just me, you know, this is from doing a lot of research too, that go most wrong, three biggest failure points um, in any change initiative, particularly of any complexity, are that people get out of mis they get out of alignment and no one catches it. And um, so somewhere along the way, we, we think we succeed, but we really didn't because some people are still saying, hey, we didn't succeed according to my definition of success. So that's number one. Resistance, we talk about managing resistance and most of the literature talks on managing it as in making, derailing it, blocking it, turn, put, pulling it back. And, and I see resistance differently. I see that when resistance is actually welcomed, when the leaders lean into it and welcome it, change, it's transformative. It, it, it is the key to making change processes functional and, and successful. And finally, focus, which is so many change initiatives get thrown over the wall. No one ever talks about them again. And then they say, well, why didn't it happen? It's like, well, it, it was never made a priority. So these three things um, can be absolutely key to making this work. So I wanna break them down real quickly. Alignment is, it's a constant challenge. And the thing is, we wanna go from A to B. We wanna go from this little orange block to that green block, and we all wanna be on the same track at the same time. But in reality, if you don't take time up front to, to get into the same block, then and, and both in terms of where we're starting and where we're ending, the trajectories end up being completely off. And, and the best example I can give of this is that if some people don't really understand the problem to begin with, and they're not bought into the vision at the end, they're not aiming for the right thing. So I have a client right now who wants to transform their process of taking work in from clients and getting it you know, into production. And we had a meeting yesterday to negotiate the new production process. And lo and behold, there are three people sitting at the table who take orders from clients, you know, who are just, who don't understand that when they just throw stuff over the wall, it sends the production people into a tizzy. So those, those people were all over the place in terms of understanding why this process needed to be. So we never even got to the, what the process should be because we were spending all our time helping everybody align around, you know, the, 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 the distraction to the organization that that chaos created. And, and how that was what the problem we were trying to solve. So to, you know, tomorrow we'll get to envisioning the process. So if we didn't take that time up front to align around the problem and what we were trying to solve, then either we could talk to her blue in the face and never come to agreement and alignment around what we're trying to achieve, or somebody would just step in and say, forget all you people, this is the way it's gonna be done. And a lot of people would walk off going, well, I'm not gonna do it that way because I don't think it's a problem. I think the way we do it now is better. So investing in that alignment both up front and all the way through the process is really critical. And we'll come back to alignment there in a minute. Anissa? I was going to just say that, uh, you know, a lot of times this alignment key is also very misunderstood simply because um, a, uh, there will be a, a nice planning uh, session or a strategic uh, planning session and everything's put down on paper um, but one initiative uh, is is viewed with a different lens of importance or value or methodology how to implement that uh, by six different members on the team and so in your experience what is it that a good uh, an effective organization must do to actually foster that alignment, drill out the conversation that confirms or denies alignment? Excellent question. Um, I will use my meeting yesterday as an example. 
the executive in the room is one of my clients and I've gone over with this with her a lot of time about how important it is for leaders to be able to create and sit in discomfort for purposes of creating alignment. So what she did when she recognized that people were yesing it, right? Yes. So just saying, okay, sure. She goes, wait a minute, stop. Because she knew this and I didn't. She knows her organization. She knows her people. And this is why leaders have to do it. It can't be something that consultants are always brought in to do. She leaned forward and she said, what are we not talking about? And Beautiful. That broke it loose. And all of a sudden we began to hear the voices of, I'm not sure I, you know, but there's value when I throw it over the wall. I, I see that that works. And, well, and then the people on the other side, yeah, because we've trained you that we can do anything and we can't. So then we started a really deep and meaningful conversation about, the, you know, coming to understand the problem and the potential solution similarly would not have happened if that leader hadn't stepped in and said, no, we're not moving on until we have a hard conversation. And, and she had to be okay with that. She couldn't be triggered into being uncomfortable with that. So that's what I've been working with her on for the last six months. And she did it beautifully. And, Excellent. And, and it worked great. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Uh, and that relates to this one about trend, about resistance. Uh, many people don't like it when people resist them. This is a human trait. <laughs> I, it's a human trait for anybody. We don't like people to disagree with us. We don't like people to challenge us. You know, it's uncomfortable. And so when people resist us, what do we do? We resist them. I did an exercise in a training session on this a couple of weeks ago where my co-presenter and I cooked up a resistance thing where, where she, she resisted me publicly in front of everybody. And then I resisted her and it got uncomfortable in the room for a hundred people real fast. And then we stopped and we turned and we said to everybody, when did that get uncomfortable? And everybody goes, when you resisted her, I said, did it get uncomfortable when she resisted me, the leader, the one who was you know, up there trying to make this all happen? And everybody goes, no, she just asked a question. You're the one that turned it into resistance by, by pushing her back. So then we played it as though, well, what if I welcome that? What does that look like? She's challenging me, but I welcome it. And now we turn it into a productive conversation that moves us all forward. So the leader's resistance is often not understood. And again, as a coach, this is where I spend a lot of my time helping leaders get comfortable with people resisting them, with having hard conversations, with leading hard conversation, with making hard decisions. When the leader is really good at welcoming that resistance, that's when they, the potential for that resistance to transform the change process into a positive thing for everybody. Because what is resistance? It is the beginning of engagement. The minute the leaders push back, they're pushing back and they're saying, we don't want engagement on this. So what the employee feels like is engagement, the leader often treats as resistance. And you gotta turn that around if you wanna get it to the point where the employee feels engaged, feels, bought in and can actually own the change. And there's a lot of different strategies for that, but that's the essential dynamic going on there. And that's what the leaders have to be able to do. They've got to invite resistance. Well, you know, one of the things that your, this, this uh, clarity uh, resembles is simply a good, effective team development program, like a five behaviors of a cohesive team, for example, something that um, establishes with management teams and leadership teams the, the really effective skills of building trust, being able to engage in productive conflict, fostering commitment through healthy dialogue and ensuring that people aren't just being yes people. Um, but that this piece about transforming resistance, uh, many organizations uh, and, and us individually are incapable of understanding that conflict is to be welcomed and it must be transformed for organizations to have a straighter line to that change you've been referencing. Exactly. That's why the vast majority of my one-on-one -on -one work with leaders is around this and around them learning to see their own role in either creating problems or creating opportunities. And once they start to unpack that for themselves, it's magical. It's magical for them. It's magical for their teams. Uh, oh, and still on resistance. So, so this is a common theory out there, which I don't subscribe to at all, and I'm about to show you why. The theory is that everybody, when they're resisting, I, I say they're looking for engagement. Um, 
but a lot of people see that resistance as, oh, it's about them. They're in anxiety. They're in fear. They're frustrated. They're not on board because they didn't think this up. So they're getting their ego involved. And we interpret resistance. And, and I'm not saying those things don't happen. But we want to make it about those employees not buying in. It's about them. It's blaming them. It's on them. And this is this, is this, uh, this model that's out there that's kind of, adapted from the Kubler-Ross grieving cycle. And the problem is, is that when we tell this story about resistance, we ignore the fact that that's not always what it is. Sometimes it's something else. Sometimes those people really have something valuable to offer to the process. And by trying to manage them through their cycle of emotions, we're not listening for those keys that they have to help us make our change initiative successful. So the, what I work with leaders on is a, is a process to convert resistance to support over and over and over again. So when people start to push against you, that's that negative sign there. You know, we're going off plan because people are resisting. You know, when the leader says, well, let's turn this, you know, let's get them back on board. And in the process of getting them back on board, let's create more buy-in and more engagement. That's when things start to move forward. But the problem is you have to do that over and over and over again because people keep they keep discovering ways this change initiative is going to change their world and they keep having anxiety or questions about that so when you set yourself up to have to manage this resistance in a way that's going to bring people back on board over and over and over again now you're becoming the leader that can make this successful and we'll make it successful. What you just said is a really, really important point. Um, I cannot tell you how many times we've seen good leaders um, experience their own level of stress when it comes to change. And once they realize that there's resistance in the ranks, instead of developing the influence, the compassion, the empathy, the, the, the coaching required to support people through the discomfort of change, a lot of times they will simply revert to, look, this is happening, get on board or get off, but we're doing this. And that simply is not an effective approach to leading change. Correct. Yep. Because what happens is when you shut it down, it just goes underground. It doesn't work. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, wish, I wish that wasn't true, but it is. Good sound bite. When you shut it down, it just goes underground. Yeah. And actually with no resistance, you have no buy-in. So that's the other thing. Sometimes leaders will say, well, we didn't have any resistance. And I said, is it working? They're like, no. I'm like, well, then you, if you didn't uncover the resistance, you're never going to get buy-in because the only way to get buy-in is to bring them back from resistance. It's a really good point. And I'm so glad you're bringing that up. I think that that goes hand in hand with the discomfort of conflict and the avoidance of conflict and the old style leadership of, of command and control and just direct. And, and here's where we're headed. Everybody get on board. And what you're saying is that, that, Productive conflict is required. Um, fostering commitment through buy-in and dealing with the discomfort is required. And accepting that this change comes in waves. It doesn't happen in a straight line. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah. And, and this is a bit of, um, it's just the psychology of, of change I've noticed in people. This is mostly in individuals, which again goes back to kind of giving us a different paradigm to look at people's uh, process through change. You start at the top, you know, the organization makes a commitment to change. And now they have to set, you know, people have to have an intention to change. There's transitions. People can go through excitement, discomfort, fear. If they're not moved to trust, then they can't personally commit. And so going back to the leader's role, when the leader breaks trust by resisting the resistance or treating natural human emotions like, am I still going to have a job after this? as a resistance. That's not resistance. That's people being people. You know, when, when the leader breaks trust, the individual cannot commit. And when the individual can commit because the leaders create trust, now the individual can have intention. They can prepare for it. They can kind of immerse, surrender to it and immerse themselves in it until it becomes their habit. So when leaders start to look at quote resistance, as actually a strategic asset to this change process as an opportunity to get people into engagement, into buy-in, into a level of trust and having to do that over and over and over again. When the leader sees that as that opportunity, now they're starting to lead in their organization 
in a completely different way and at a much higher level. And a lot of this is because the leaders are beginning to become capable of operating in their own emotional intelligence at a deeper and deeper level. So they're being able to, not just in change process, not just because of you know, some big initiative by the organization, but in the day-to-day -day change challenges, they're getting to be better communicators. They're helping people buy into things that are happening on smaller scales. They're learning to motivate their staff in different ways um, and to manage conflict, as you said, in different ways and to actually take ownership. One leader I worked with, <laughs> You know, he came and he's like, I, I, my team just won't buy in. So I gave him some techniques to just engage his people, lock, listen to them, talk to them about, suspend your judgment for just a minute and listen to them. And he came back like a week later and said, oh my gosh, that was magical. <laughs> they started telling me what they, what they think. And I'm like, no, they've been telling you the whole time. You just weren't listening. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it can be magical. And a lot of that is because What's happening is when the leaders are able to manage change, they're developing themselves as leaders at very deep levels. And they're, be they're beginning to become co capable themselves of coaching others, which is a key. Um, let's take a look here at looking at how much we support our leaders to manage and lead change. Do we invest in coaching leaders to the point where they're really developing their own EQ? You know, EQ um, is one of those that I find that a lot of folks, it, it's also like cultural intelligence. So a lot of folks believe that they are culturally aware and understand diversity and inclusivity. Um, similarly, emotional intelligence, I find a lot of folks believe that they already possess it, um, even when we might call them um, challenged on the spectrum <laughs> of emotional intelligence. Uh, what has been your experience uh, when you are working with leaders in in their emotional intelligence, what supports them in getting over that awareness factor that, oh, maybe I do have an opportunity here for development portion of change? Yeah, as with all things, it's very individual and, you know, you meet people where they are. And, and what I usually find is, is that, the, you know, the growth mindset concept there? Uh-huh. That when, when people, for those who aren't familiar, there's um, an author, I'm forgetting on her name, her name right now, but she talks about the growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset. And when people make the shift from, I think I understand everything I need to know to, nope, I'm never going to know it all. There's always something more for me to learn about anything. That's when they become open to this. Uh, but to answer your question on the tactical level, usually somebody, sometimes it's a, it's a two by four and sometimes it's more subtle, but they need to get an outside perspective they value and trust that says, I see opportunity for you to grow. A lot of times that's their boss. Sometimes it's someone else in their life who's important to them. And sometimes it's a coach. That makes perfect sense. All right, so we are sharing the results. Um, yes, 33% are saying yes. We're working uh, to with our leaders to help them manage and lead change. No. Uh, for 42% and not sure, whereas 100% of the folks on the call um, said we are going through some type of change. Uh, uh, it only looks like only one out of three are actually confirmed to be mm, investing in coaching or training and managing their uh, change. Yeah, and, and that's not terribly unusual, but it is a missed opportunity because the thing is, is that for to have a leader who can be capable of, of creating and managing people through discomfort intentionally, they have to be a coach to their employees. And the only way I've ever known anyone to be a good coach is someone who has been coached. Mm. That's my own experience. Um, going just to the other two factors and then some examples here and get focusing more on HR. Um, the second thing here is focus. This one's pretty straightforward but I am amazed at how many leaders just say, I don't understand why we didn't do that thing I told everybody to do. You know, we, we yes. rolled it out. <laughs> we rolled it out. Why aren't people doing it? And, and that's because of this major, major misperception is, is that leaders, their top down view of things are, well, we just, we tell people to do it and then we expect an orderly implementation process. And, you know, so we look at it as like we set off the train and the trains on the tracks but that's not how people, that's not how employees experience it. They're down there going, oh, this stuff's coming at me. It's too much. I don't understand it. 
no one is helping me prioritize things. And so I want to help, but I can't. And it's that priority thing that is key because that's what leaders need to do. I mean, they need to create vision. They need to get buy-in and, and engagement and have, and have everybody heading in the same direction, which is what alignment does for you. But along the way, there will be conflicts in priority. And so leaders have to step in and manage that. And if the leaders aren't continually, literally every week saying, yes, this is still important, it will not happen. And that has to be consistently. And that means some things have to be less important. Um, and there's a concept around sprints that we really don't have time for, but it's a technique that can be used to help leaders um, stay focused and yet still get a lot done. So, you know, it's, we could go on this forever, but the point is, is that leaders need to lead. And one of the ways they do that is by continuing to prioritize the change high enough for the organization to stay focused on it. One of the tools that we have found very effective um, when supporting our clients in change is uh, the 12 week year is a, a book that helps folks put their strategic plan into a 12 week protocol and helps leaders hold their uh, team accountable to uh, a, having ownership of their portion of the change, their portion of the, the task list, um, but also to aligning that vision in terms of 12 week, uh, many successes in my NI successes along the way. Uh, and I uh, imagine that's what your, your sprints is about. It's having fast wins that are aligned with the change, that are aligned with the shared vision uh, along the way. Yeah, and, and we'll, let me come back to that point. I have another slide here. We can kind of unpack that a little bit, but yes, te technically it's similar. Great. Um, so going back to, you know, what, what must the leaders be capable of doing to manage that squiggly line while the project managers are down making sure the tasks get done? They have to be able to create and drive alignment, including managing the discomfort of resistance and welcoming it and transforming it into engagement and trust. Um, and they have to do their prioritization job, which if there's one thing a leader has to do to be successful, it's to, <laughs> to be able to prioritize things for their teams and their resources. So, so if those are the things that leaders, you know, we're asking leaders to do, um, let's look at culture because here's the thing that I have discovered, which probably is, you know, not rocket science, but when change competence is a cultural habit in leadership, then the organization can begin to regularly succeed at change. So the leadership culture has got to um, be change competent at a minimum, if not change masterful at a maximum. So the question is for you all, you know, how many of your organizations even focus on changing the culture and, and adapting the culture to become change competent. You know, this is a, a interesting, uh, when you say that you need to become change competent, um, I know that coaching can do that, but what else helps leaders and um, HR folks enable their management team to become change competent? Um, well, it's interesting because I, I have, seen a lot of change incompetent organizations that talk about change all the time and try to do the latest model of change and you know they're they they're they feel knowledgeable and focused on it so they feel competent on it and yet they fail and which is how i derive these three core things i just shared was like these are the things they're still doing wrong um but to to your answer your question i think a lot of it has to do with the very top leader, the, the CEO, him or herself, and how comfortable are they with discomfort? How comfortable are they with the messiness of change? Because if they're not, it's going to roll downhill. <laughs> hmm. That's a really good point. So my organization is focused on culture change. Uh, yes, we are focused on culture change. Uh, and and the largest percentage, over 50, were yes, and uh, the remainder are unclear. Good. That's, I mean, that's better than it was a few years ago, I think. Um, and the reason I ask that question is that when looking at culture change, 
um, everything I talked about is relevant, but I have noticed that there's one other strategy which may relate to the idea of sprints that I mentioned, but also this 12 week, what did you call it? The 12 week? 12 week year. The 12 week year, yeah. So there's a principle in change management um, literature and study around quick wins and small wins. And I have seen this, I have actually seen it in others, but I've also implemented it myself pretty successfully that if you think about every quarter, now I'm talking about culture specifically here, this can be adapted to other change types, other change initiatives as well. But with respect to culture change, if, if you look at every quarter, this little yellow star here, dropping in a new skill. And I call this the nudge because um, Dr. Thayer, you know, has this great nudge theory about, you know, we don't try to do things all at once. We do it in small increments. And, but with a vision towards where we're going. And what I've seen in these opportunities I've had to drop in these new skills and then give the organization a quarter or more, depending on what you're really asking them to change, to adapt to a very unique thing. <laughs> um, and then you drop another skill in, in the next quarter, and then you drop another skill in. And pretty soon you're, you're nudging people into change because in that quarter, you don't just drop, you don't throw it over the wall. You actually support it. You get employee feedback, you give them training, support, coaching, you know, taking some champions who can become vocal about it and visible about it, talking about how they implement it and how it works, doing some survey pop follow up. I have one organization that's putting into place quarterly performance reviews. So they're kind of rolling in this, these cultural skills that they're seeding into the organization, you know, they're, they're rolling that into their performance reviews and they're kind of bringing their leaders into uh, becoming part of the nudge, if you will. And it can be very powerful. And just to give you an example of one of the skills that I've had the most success with in terms of dropping it in up front is a, a form of consensus uh, where you're not looking for everybody to agree with everything. You're, lo you're looking to lead people towards alignment and agreeing to be able to live with something. And I don't have time to go into the whole principle now, but when leaders get a hold of this, it gives them tools to lead agreement in a new way. And I've had two organizations that has literally transformed, like literally in one quarter. All of a sudden, people are talking about how to reach agreement in a completely different way. And you have some core lessons like that and skills that the organization commits to take on. And then in the space of a year, you can have a very powerful transformation on the cultural level, assuming that the leadership is bought in and is living that because otherwise middle management goes, I don't know why I'm investing in this because my boss isn't and his boss isn't or her boss isn't. So that's a key. But when it works, it works amazingly well for shifting a culture in small increments. And there are other ways to apply this, this, concept of sprints in the 12 week year and stuff. Um, but, but this is one of the most powerful ones that I've personally um, engaged in. Um, and now we, that brings us really, particularly with the discussion of culture change to HR and the role of talent management, because, you know, change when it's successful means new habits. Who has those new habits? It's the people. <laughs> And HR is more and more on point for this. You know, heads of HR feel that they need to be involved in change. CEOs are expecting HR to be involved in change because change is people. People are the ones that do the changing and make it stick. Um, and the stress that change creates has an impact on productivity, has an impact on people's ability to perform. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, when change is successful, people are performing better. And who's in charge of people performing better? Talent management. <laughs> so that's pretty straightforward. Um, and I'm curious for the people on the phone, you know, who, who on the phone is actually in charge of leading change in some form in their organization? You know, this uh, nudge concept, uh, we had a, a question about uh, will the webinar today talk about the, the boiled frog <laughs> approach? <laughs> and the boiled frog approach uh, is simply that idea that if the frog is already in the water and you turn up the heat slowly, it won't notice that it's being boiled. 
right? And so in change management, if change happens incrementally and slowly over time without a huge contrast, then people begin to accept the change and, and there's less resistance. And um, you were explaining to me when we brought that up uh, prior to our webinar today uh, that the nudge approach is similar in that it is incremental changes, it is reasonably paced change, um, but it is with greater transparency. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. In other words, the you don't want to kill the frog. Right. right. <laughs> you don't want to boil the water. You want to warm it and then let the frog be happy swimming around in it. So, so yeah, it's, 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 it goes back to this idea of resisting resistance. Like you're not trying to boil the frog and make them not notice that you're changing. No, you want to bring them into the process and have them be part of that change. And in the nudge process, it's doing it in such a way as to where most of our threshold for change can be um, monitored and we can pay attention and we can have a, a better awareness of when we've met our employees threshold for stress and threshold for change and threshold for fear and it, uh, the nudge approach al allows an organization to create the change but without so much stress is what I'm understanding. Well said. Okay. So our poll results, I personally am charged with leading change in my organization. We've got about 40, 60. 40 say, yes, I am, uh, and 60 that are not. Yeah, that's, that's a, that seems fairly normal to me, and I'm glad to see that people on the phone are engaged um, in it. Um, I wanted to just do two real quick examples, and particularly with respect to HR and, and HR's involvement. This, this is a... Um, Lori there in this in this bottom corner here is a colleague and friend of mine um, who has been leading a lot of change inside an organization called K-12. K-12 has about 4,700 employees. They have contractors, almost half that. They manage um, public schools in 33 states. And um, they really, they, they ran into some problems. They brought a team together. They said, we need to do change better. You know, we rolled it out and nothing happened. Uh, and HR was brought to the table to talk about like a report about employee turnover. Like that's why HR was invited to that meeting about, you know, how the company had to turn things around. And Lori stood up and said, I know you want me to talk about employee turnover and I will, but I see opportunities here for us to have some development, some employee development programs that really give people the tools they need to engage in change. And she took the lead. She ended up managing that task force. The lead, she got leadership committed to making change a core competence for all their employees. They, she helped put a governance group in process that watched, you know, that, that was able to manage some of the big high level changes at the top, top level, strategic level of the company. Um, and then she, through her HR capacity, and she was sort of talent development, recruiting, management, all that stuff. You know, she was able to continue rolling out training and tools as new employees came on board. One of the things they uncovered is they'd made some leadership changes that took the people who were good at change and put them in the wrong place to lead change. Mm -hmm. So they had to have some conversations around that. That was an HR, you know, that was right in her wheelhouse. So had she not stood up, had she not volunteered, had she not taken a leadership role, they would not have been successful. Similarly, um, this is a client of mine, uh, it's a US government agency, about 4,500 employees, a lot, they're spread out all over the place in all, all of the states. They have new leadership every four years because we have an election and they have a thousand bosses. And the leadership saw they weren't getting through with some of their big initiatives and HR and training became proactive. They stepped up, they said, you know what? You know, we, people are not, you're not being successful because you're throwing it over the wall. Let's give people the skills they need. And so. We're putting in a training program, but also coaching to support the people who go through training um, because we want to reinforce those soft skills and in particular in teams. So individual leaders can opt into the coaching, but we're also coaching entire teams um, in the hope that we can sort of infect the whole organization with some of these soft skills because they have to survive it. You know, every four years they've got to go through this. So there we're really starting to see some success by some leaders stepping in and going, yeah, I need to be good at this, show me how. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to offer, throw out there is that I have a white paper that covers 
a lot of what we've been talking about, plus a whole lot more we don't have time for right now. And I would invite anybody to go to my website and download it um, and uh, reach out to, to take this into more depth if you'd like. Fantastic. Well, um, thank you, Dana. That was uh, really um, eye-opening. I love the models that you introduced. Uh, I love the different resources that you shared. And I want to let folks know on the call, if you have questions, um, do let us know. We have a few more minutes to the top of the hour uh, if you're sharing your lunch with us. Um, I also want to open it up. One of the things that Dana and I would be happy to do is um, just have a conversation, consult with you. Um, whether or not you have a need for a leadership program or employee development program or a a formal change management program if there is something you are implementing that we might be able to support you with um, whether that's through dialogue or sharing our experience or sharing best practice we would be very open to that and if you take us up on our fast pass strategy session we have a, a, a pretty nice agenda it looks like what's the challenge how do we define the gap and let's outline the solution together this is something that um, our clients do pay us for but for those folks on the call we are offering as complimentary just for sharing Showing up and uh, sharing your time with us. I think we might have had a someone raise their hand. Let me see. Nope, looks like your hand is down. If you have questions, you can put it in that chat box. Um, but Dana, if you were to provide someone with the, your top two tips for immediately addressing the need for leaders to understand change, uh, what would be those first top two tips? Uh, you mean for the, to, if you're in an HR role trying to help your leadership? That's right. Address it? Um, well, <laughs> I would say that the top two tips are just to um, share maybe that the statistics in terms of the organizations that are following the typical models out there, the typical change management um, rubric out there are still 50% unsuccessful. And so whatever leadership is going to be doing to, to bring change management as a discipline into the organization really has to account for the, the things that make it go off the rails 50% of the time and that that's a human challenge um, and that HR talent development needs to be part of the human solution, which is gonna come through up-leveling you know, the leaders in particular, um, and taking them into new territory. Excellent. I think that's very helpful. So um, clarity, um, sharing with their teams that uh, change management really is hard and, and most of us won't uh, be successful unless we are aware of how to create change, how to support change, and aware of the human tendency to resist change. <laughs> and so then that means providing those resources, coaching, training, um, you know, other developmental resources uh, that support leadership and management in becoming more competent in change. So that's yeah. very helpful. I, I would say too, there's the part of that conversation might be sharing an idea that many leaders may not have thought about, which is learning to see resistance as a strategic asset. Yes, most, I love that. You know, everybody thinks, oh, change, manage change. I'm sorry, manage resistance. And it's like, no when you can transform resistance into a strategic asset for your company and your change initiative, now you're going to succeed. And that's a different idea for people. So maybe a leader would wake up and go, hmm, tell me more about that. How can I lean into this resistance as opposed to resist it, shut it down? I think yeah. that's a, a key takeaway. So Dana, thank you so very much for sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you everyone for joining us. If we may support you, do reach out. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.